Perpetual Peace, a Philosophic Essay, by Immanuel Kant, Benjamin Trueblood Translation. Preface and Author's Introduction. Preface. No American edition of Kant's great tractate on perpetual peace has been available for the use of those interested in the study of the historic development of the idea of international concord. Two or three English translations are in existence, but the latest of these, that by Professor Hasty, published in 1891, while excellent in its reproduction of Kant's meaning, is often involved in style and far from easy to follow. The German of the essay is intricate in structure and often very difficult to understand. Every translator of it has not only to render it into his own tongue, but at the same time to interpret its meaning. The present translator has tried to perform this double task in a way to make Kant's thought easily comprehensible to all intelligent American readers. He is painfully aware how imperfectly the task has been accomplished. Kant's footnotes, some of which are long and not particularly relevant, have been omitted as not necessary to a proper understanding of the essay. BFT, Boston, 1897 Author's Introduction To Perpetual Peace whether the above satirical inscription, once put by a certain Dutch innkeeper on his signboard on which a graveyard was painted, holds of men in general, or particularly of the heads of state who are never sated with war, or perhaps only of those philosophers who are always dreaming their sweet dream of peace, need not be here discussed. The author of the present essay claims for himself, however, in presenting his ideas, the protection of one fact. The practical statesman, when he comes in contact with the theoretical statesman, assumes a haughty air and looks down upon him with great self-satisfaction as a mere theorizer whose empty ideas can bring no danger to the state, founded, as it must be, on the principles derived from experience. The worldly wise statesman may therefore, without giving himself any concern, allow the theorizer to throw his eleven skittle balls all at once. This practical statesman must therefore, in case of a contest with the theoretical statesman, so far as proceed consistently as not to suspect that any danger to the state lurks behind the opinions which the latter ventures honestly and openly to express. The author of this essay feels assured that, through this saving clause, he will be in the best manner possible protected against all malicious interpretation. End Preface and Author's Introduction First Section, which contains the preliminary articles of a perpetual peace between states. First Article No conclusion of peace shall be held to be such which is made with the secret reservation of the material for a future war. For in that event, it would be a mere truce, a postponement of hostilities, not a peace. Peace means the end of all hostilities, and to attach to it the adjective perpetual is a pleonasm, which at once arouses suspicion. The causes of a future war, which are present, though perhaps not at the time known even to the powers which are making peace with each other, are entirely removed through a treaty of peace. Even those which a keen and dexterous search might discover in documents laid away in the public archives. The mental reservation of old claims to be brought forward in the future, of which neither party dares at the time to make mention, because both are too much exhausted to continue the war, with the base intention of taking advantage of the first favorable opportunity to assert them, is genuine Jesuitic casuistry. Such a procedure, when looked at in its true character, must be considered beneath the dignity of rulers, and so must the disposition to pursue 
such deductions, be held unworthy a minister of state. But if, in accordance with certain, quote, enlightened, unquote, notions of political wisdom, the true honor of the state is held to consist in the continual increase of power by any and every means, of course the judgment just given will be looked upon as visionary and pedantic. Article 2. No state having an independent existence, whether it be small or great, may be acquired by another state, through inheritance, exchange, purchase, or gift. A state is not a possession or patrimony, like the soil on which it has its seat. It is a society of men, subject to the authority and disposition of none but itself. Since, like a stem, it has its own roots, to incorporate it as a graft into another state is to take away its existence as a moral person and to make of it a thing. This contradicts the idea of the original compact, without which no authority over a people can even be conceived. Everybody knows into what danger, even in the most recent times, the supposed right of thus acquiring states has brought Europe. Other parts of the world have known nothing of it. But in Europe, it has been held that states can marry each other. This has been looked upon in part as a new kind of industry, a way of making oneself powerful through family connections without putting forth personal effort in part also as a way of extending one's landed possessions. In the same category must be reckoned also the letting out of troops of one state to another, against an enemy not common to the two. Thus the subjects of the state are used and abused as things to be handled at will. Article 3 Standing armies shall, after a time, be entirely abolished. For they incessantly threaten other states with war, through their appearing always to be in armed readiness for it. States are thus provoked to outdo one another in number of armed men, without limit. Through the expense thus occasioned, peace finally becomes more burdensome than a brief war. These armies are thus the cause of wars of aggression, undertaken in order that this burden may be thrown off. In addition to this, the hiring out of men to kill and be killed, and employment of them as mere machines and tools in the hands of another, the state, cannot be reconciled with the rights of humanity as we feel them in our own person. The case is entirely different where the citizens of a state voluntarily drill themselves at stated times in the practice of arms with a view of defending themselves and their fatherland against attacks from without. It would be exactly the same with the accumulation of a war fund. Looked upon by other states as a threat of war, it would lead to their anticipating such a war by making an attack themselves. Because of the three powers, the power of the army, the power of alliance, and the power of money, the last might well be considered the most reliable instrument of war. The difficulty of ascertaining the amount of the fund accumulated might, however, possibly work a counter-effect. Article 4 no national debts shall be contracted in connection with the foreign affairs of the state. The obtaining of money, either from without or from within the state, for purposes of internal improvement, the improvement of highways, the planting of new colonies, the storing of supplies for years of crop failure, etc., need create no suspicion. Foreign debts may be contracted for this purpose. But, as an instrument of opposition between the powers, a credit system of debts endlessly growing, though always safe against immediate demand, 
the demand for payment not being made by all the creditors at the same time. Such a system, the ingenious invention of a trading people in this century, is a dangerous money power. It is a resource for carrying on war which surpasses the resources of all other states taken together. It can only be exhausted through a possible deficit of the taxes, which may be long kept off through the revival of commerce brought about by the reflex influence of the loans on industry and trade. The facility thus afforded of making war coupled with the seemingly innate inclination thereto of those possessing power, is a great obstacle in the way of perpetual peace. This obstacle must be made impossible by a preliminary article, all the more because the finally unavoidable bankruptcy of the state must involve many other states innocently in the disaster, thus inflicting upon them a public injury. Consequently, other states are at least justified in entering into an alliance against such a state and its pretensions. Article 5. No state shall interfere by force in the constitution and government of another state. For what could justify it in taking such action? Could, forsooth, some offense which that state gives to the subjects of another state? Such a state ought rather to serve as a warning, because of the example of the evils which a state brings upon itself by its lawlessness. In general, the bad example given by one free person to another, as a scandalum acceptum, is no lesion in his rights. But the case would be different if a state, because of internal dissension, should be divided into two parts each of which, while claiming to constitute a special state, should lay claim to the whole. An outside state, if it should render assistance to one of these, could not be charged with interfering in the constitution of another state, as that state would then be in a condition of anarchy. But as long as this inner strife was not decided, the interference of outside powers would be a trespass on the rights of an independent people struggling only with its own inner weakness. This interference would be an actual offense, which would so far tend to render the autonomy of all states insecure. Article 6. No state at war with another shall permit such kinds of hostility as will make mutual confidence impossible in time of future peace, such as the employment of assassins, of poisoners, the violation of capitulation, the instigation of treason in the state against which it is making war. These are dishonorable stratagems. Some sort of confidence in an enemy's mental honesty must remain even in time of war, for otherwise no peace could be concluded and the conflict would become a war of extermination. For war is only the dire necessity of asserting one's rights by force in a primitive state of society where there is no court at hand to decide in accordance with right. In this state, neither party can be declared an unjust enemy, for this presupposes a judicial decision. The issue of the conflict, as in the case of so-called judgment of God, decides on whose side the right is. But between states, no war of punishment can be conceived, because between them there is no relation of superior and subordinate. Whence it follows that a war of extermination, in which destruction may come to both parties at the same time, and to all right also, would result in perpetual peace only when the whole human race was dead and buried. Such a war, therefore, as well as the use of the means which might bring it about, is wholly unallowable but that the means mentioned above inevitably lead to such a result is clear from the fact that such hellish arts, 
which are in themselves degrading when once brought into use, do not continue long within the limits of war. The employment of spies, for example, in which only the dishonorableness of others, which cannot be exterminated all at once, is employed, goes over and is continued in time of peace, and thus the purpose of the peace is quite frustrated. Although the laws above laid down would be objectively, that is, in the intention of the powers, only prohibitive laws, yet some of them are strict laws, which are valid without distinction of circumstances, and they would tend immediately to produce their prohibitive effects. Such are numbers 1, 5, and 6. Others, as numbers 2, 3, and 4, though not to be considered as exceptions to the principle of right, yet, in respect to the application of these principles, are subjective, because circumstances often make the time of application indefinite. They admit of delay in fulfillment, without losing sight of their purpose. The purpose, however, does not admit of everlasting delay to the Greek kalends, as Augustus was wont to say. The restoration, for example, to certain states of the freedom of which they have been deprived, contrary to our second article, must not be indefinitely put off. The delay has in view not non-restoration, but that there may not be undue haste with its consequent mischief. For the prohibition laid down by the article affects only the mode of acquisition, which is not to be allowed to continue, not the actual state of possession, which, though not conferring a really just title, yet, at the time of the supposed acquisition, was held by all states to be legitimate according to the current public opinion. End first section. Second section, which contains the definite articles for a perpetual peace between states. The state of peace between men who live near one another is not the state of nature. The natural state is rather one of war. In this state, if there are not always actual hostilities, they at least continually threaten. The state of peace must therefore be created for it is not necessarily secured by the mere absence of hostilities. Even if hostile acts are not committed by one neighbor against another, a state which only the existence of law can bring about, the one can always treat the other as an enemy when he pleases to challenge him to hostilities. Article 1 the first definitive article for the securing of perpetual peace, the civil constitution in every state shall be republican. In the first place, a constitution founded in accordance with the principles of freedom of a society of men is necessarily republican. In the second place, this is true of one constructed according to the fundamental idea of the dependence of all as subjects upon a common legislation. It is true, thirdly, of one formed according to the principle of the equality of the citizens of the state. The Republican Constitution is the only one springing out of the idea of the original compact, on which all legitimate legislation of a people must be based. As far as right is concerned, the Republican principle, in fact, lies originally at the basis of all forms of the civil constitution. The only question, therefore, is whether it is the only one which will lead to perpetual peace. In reality, then, the Republican Constitution, in addition to the fact that it springs out of the pure concept of right, gives promise of realizing the desire to end, namely, perpetual peace. The reason of this may be stated as follows. Where the consent of the citizens of the state is required to determine whether there shall be war or not, as must necessarily be the case where the republican constitution is in force, 
nothing is more natural than that they should hesitate much before entering on so perilous a game. If they do so, they must take upon themselves all the burdens of war, that is, the fighting, the defraying of the expenses of war out of their own possessions, the reparation of the destruction which it causes, and, greatest of all, the burden of the debts incurred, an endless burden because of the continual prospect of new wars, and one which therefore embitters peace itself. On the contrary, in a state where the government is not republican, and the subject not a voting citizen, war is the easiest thing in the world to enter upon, because the ruler is not a fellow citizen of the state, but its owner. War does not therefore interfere the least with his table enjoyments, his hunting, his pleasure castles, his court feasts, and the like. He decides lightly to enter upon it, as if it were a sort of pleasure party, and as to its propriety, he without concern leaves the justification of it to the diplomatic corps, who are always ready to find him excuses. That the republican constitution is not confounded with the democratic, as is generally done, the following must be noted. The forms of the state, civitas, may be divided either according to the difference of the persons holding the governing power, or according to the mode of government of the people through their ruler, whoever he may be. The first is properly called the form of sovereignty, forma imperii. Only three forms of this kind are possible, according as either one only, or some allied together, or all who make up the body of citizens, possess the governing power. Here we have autocracy, aristocracy, and democracy. The second is the form of the government, forma regiminis, and has regard to the mode in which the state makes use of its supreme power, the mode, of course, being conformable to the constitution as an act of the general will, whereby the mass of individuals becomes a people. Under this aspect, the government is either republican or despotic. Republicanism is that form of government in which the executive power is separated from the legislative. Despotism is the irresponsible administration of the state by laws which the ruler himself has enacted. Here, the public will is regarded by the ruler as his own private will. Of the three forms of the state, that of democracy in the proper sense of the word, is necessarily a despotism, because it establishes an executive power in which all decide about, and possibly also, against one who may not be in accord with it. Hence the all are not really all. This is a contradiction of the general will with itself, and with liberty. Every form of government which is not representative is, properly speaking, not a form of government at all, because one and the same person can no more be lawgiver and at the same time executive administrator of the lawgiver's will than the major premise of a syllogism can be at the same time the conclusion under the minor. Although the other two forms of state constitution are so far erroneous that they give room for such a form of government, yet with them, it is at least possible to have a form of government in harmony with the spirit of a representative system. Frederick II, for example, was accustomed to say that he was simply the highest servant of the state. On the contrary, the democratic constitution makes it impossible to have a representative government, because everybody wishes to be lord. We may say, therefore, that the smaller the number of of the personal administrators of the state, and the greater the constituency represented by them, the more possible it is to have republicanism under the Constitution, at least, finally, through a process of gradual reform. 
For this reason, it is more difficult in an aristocracy than in a monarchy to reach this only perfect form of constitution according to the principles of right. In a democracy, it is impossible to do so except by means of a violent revolution. The mode of government is, however, of incomparably more importance to the people than the form of the state. Though upon the constitution also very much depends the state's capacity of reaching the end of its existence. But the mode of government, if it is to conform to the idea of right, must necessarily be in accordance with the representative system. In this system alone is a republican form of government possible. Without it, whatever be the nature of the constitution, the form of government is despotic and violent. None of the ancient so-called republics had this system. Hence, they could not help ending in despotism, of the different kinds of which, that is the most endurable in which the supreme power is lodged in a single individual. Article 2 Second Definitive Article for the establishment of a perpetual peace. International right shall be founded on a federation of free states. Peoples considered as states may be regarded as individual men. In their natural state, that is, without the restraints of outward laws, they are liable to do one another injury because of their proximity to one another. Every one of them, therefore, for the sake of its own safety, can and ought to demand of the others to enter with it into a constitution, like that of the citizens of a state, in which each of them can be secured in its right. This would be a federation of peoples, but not necessarily an international state. For this would involve a contradiction because each state contains the relation of a superior or lawgiver to an inferior or subject, while a number of peoples brought together in a single state would form but a single people. This would contradict the principle laid down, since we are here considering the rights of peoples in reference to one another, insofar as they are to be regarded as so many different states, and not as fused into one. We now look with deep disdain on the attachment of savages to their lawless freedom, their preference to be engaged in incessant strife rather than submit themselves to a self-imposed restraint of law, their preference of wild freedom to rational freedom. All this we regard as savagery, coarseness, and beastly degradation of human nature. One would think that civilized people, each constituted into a state, would eagerly hasten to get out of a similar detestable condition in their relations to one another as speedily as possible. Instead of this, however, every state considers its majesty, majesty of a people would be an absurd term, to consist in submitting itself to no external compulsion of law whatever, and the glory of the ruler is held to consist in his being free from danger himself and having at his command thousands ready to sacrifice for him in a cause in which they have not the slightest interest. The difference between the European savages and the American consists chiefly in the fact that while many tribes of the latter are entirely eaten up by their enemies, the former know how to make a better use of their captives than to roast and eat them. They use them to increase the number of their subjects, and thereby the number of instruments for still more extensive wars. The baseness of human nature is openly exhibited in the unrestrained relations of peoples to one another, whereas it is much concealed, through the restraint of government, in the civil life of each people, where law is in force. It is matter of wonder, therefore, that the word right has not yet been wholly excluded from the policy of war as pedantic, and that no state has yet been bold enough openly to declare itself in favor of such exclusion. For Hugo Grotius, 
Puffendorf, Vattel, and others, all miserable comforters, unfortunately, though their philosophically or diplomatically conceived codes have not and cannot have the least legal force, because states as such are not under any common outward restraint, are nevertheless always sincerely quoted to justify any outbreak of war. No example, however, is to be found, on the other hand, where a state has been induced by arguments supported by the theories of these influential men to desist from any warlike undertaking. This attachment shown by every state, at least professedly, to the idea of right, shows that there is to be found in man, though at the time dormant, a moral principle of superior force which leads him to strive for the mastery over the evil principle which is undeniably in him, and to expect such mastery from others. For otherwise, states which wish to go to war with one another would never utter the word right, not even to make a jest of it, like the Gallic prince who said, It is the prerogative which nature has given to the strong over the weak that the latter should obey him. The method by which states prosecute their rights cannot, under present conditions, be a process of law, since no court exists having jurisdiction over them, but only war. But through war, even if it result in victory, the question of right is not decided. The treaty of peace puts an end to the present war, not to the condition out of which a new pretext for war may arise. Nor can this pretext be declared out and out unjust, since in this condition every state is judge in its own cause. It is now true of states according to the law of nations, as of men in a lawless state according to the law of nature, that they ought to get out of this state because, as states, they already have an internal constitution founded on right, and thus have outgrown the coercive right of others to bring them under a wider legal constitution in accordance with their conceptions of right. Yet reason, from its supreme throne of moral law-giving power, condemns war absolutely as a means of establishing right, and on the other hand, makes the state of peace an immediate duty. This state, however, cannot be secured without a compact of the nations with each other. There must, therefore, be a compact of a peculiar kind, which may be called a Pacific Federation, foetus pacificum, which differs from a treaty of peace, pactum pacis, in that the latter aims to put an end to one war simply, while the former seeks to abolish all wars forever. This federation would not be invested with a single power of a constituted state, but would secure simply the preservation and security of the freedom of a particular state and of others federated with it, without any of them having to submit themselves to public laws and to compulsion under them, as men do in a state of nature. The practicability or capability of objective realization of this idea of federation, which ought gradually to be extended to all states, and in this way lead to perpetual peace, is capable of being demonstrated. For if it should happen that a powerful and enlightened people should form itself into a republic, a form of government naturally tending to perpetual peace, this would furnish a nucleus of federative union for other states to connect themselves with. Thus the states would secure the conditions of freedom according to the idea of international right. And this federation, through the adhesion of other peoples, might be extended more and more. It is easy to understand that a people should say to itself, we will have no war among ourselves, for we will form ourselves into a state, that is, set ourselves up as a supreme law-giving, governing, and directing authority which shall peacefully dispose of our strifes. But if this state should say, There shall be no war between me and other states, 
although I recognize no supreme legislative authority which secures to me my right, and to which I secure its right, it is impossible to understand on what ground confidence in the securing of right would be based, except it be on something similar to the union of men in civil society, that is, a voluntary federation, which reason necessarily associates with the concept of the right of nations. Otherwise, nothing more can be said of the subject at all. The right to go to war is inconceivable as an element in the concept of international right, for that would be a right based not on universally valid external laws which limit the freedom of every individual, but on the one-sided principle of determining by force what is right. By the right of war, then, we must mean that men who are so minded do perfectly right when they destroy one another, and thus find perpetual peace only in the wide tomb which conceals all the horrible deeds of violence along with their perpetrators. For states in their relations to one another, there can be, according to reason, no other way out of the lawless condition which inevitably results in war than that they give up their lawless freedom, just as individual men do, accommodate themselves to public constraining laws, and so form an international state, civitas gentium, which will grow and at last embrace all the peoples of the earth. But inasmuch as the nations, according to their ideas of international right, do not wish this, and consequently reject in practice what is right in principle, if all is not to be lost, there can be, in place of the positive idea of a world republic, only the negative substitute of a permanent and ever-growing federation as a preventive of war. Such a federation would hold in check the lawless and hostile passions of men, which, however, would always be liable to burst forth anew. As Virgil says, Furor impious intus fremit horridus ore crento. Article 3. Third definitive article for the establishment of perpetual peace. The rights of men as citizens of the world shall be restricted to conditions of universal hospitality. Here, as in the former articles, the question is not one of philanthropy, but of right. Hospitality here signifies the right of a foreigner, in consequence of his arrival on the soil of another, not to be treated by him as an enemy. He may be expelled, if that can be done without his destruction, but so long as he keeps his place and conducts himself peacefully, he must not be treated in a hostile way. He cannot claim to be treated thus because of any right as a guest, for this would require a special friendly agreement to consider him for a time as a member of some household. His claim is based on a right of visitation, common to all men, by virtue of which he may join any society of men on account of the right of the common possession of the surface of the earth, over which people cannot spread abroad indefinitely, but must finally endure living near one another. Originally, however, no one had any more right than another to occupy any particular portion of the earth's surface. The communities of men are separated by uninhabitable portions of this surface, the seas and the desert, but in such a way that the ship and the camel, the ship of the desert, make it possible for men to visit one another across these unclaimed regions, and to use the right to the surface, which men possess in common, for the purposes of social intercourse. The inhospitable practice in vogue on some sea coasts, as of the Barbary states, of robbing ships in the neighboring seas, or of making slaves of shipwrecked people, or that of the inhabitants of deserts, such as the Bedouins, of regarding their proximity to nomadic tribes as a right to plunder them, is thus contrary to the right of nature. 
The right to hospitality, which naturally belongs to foreign visitors, extends no further than that degree of social intercourse which the old inhabitants determined by the limits of possibility. In this way, remote portions of the world may come into friendly relations with one another, which at last come to be regulated by public law, and thus bring the human race finally nearer and nearer to a state of world citizenship. If the inhospitable behavior of the civilized commercial states of our portion of the world be compared with this barbarian inhospitality, the injustice which they show when they go to foreign lands and peoples, for they consider their arrival the same as conquest, becomes simply horrible. America, the Negro lands, the Spice Islands, the Cape, etc., were considered by them when they discovered them as belonging to nobody. For the inhabitants, they counted as nothing. Into East India, under the pretext of simply establishing trading posts, they introduced men of war, and with them oppression of the natives, instigation of the different states of the country into widespread wars, famine, insurrection, treachery, and so on through the whole category of evils which afflict the human race. China and Japan, which had had experience with such guests, have done wisely in limiting their intercourse, the former permitting access to her coasts but not entrance into the interior, the latter granting access only to a single European people, the Dutch, whom, however, like prisoners, they shut out from intercourse with the natives. The worst of the matter, or rather, from the standpoint of the moral judge, the best, is that they get no satisfaction out of this violence, that all these commercial societies are on the point of going to pieces, that the Sugar Islands, the seat of the most shocking and complete slavery, yield no real profit, but only an indirect and at the same time undesirable one, namely, the furnishing of sailors for war fleets, through whom they assist in carrying on wars in Europe. Thus these powers, which make a great show of piety, drink injustice like water, and at the same time wish themselves to be considered as the very elect of the orthodox faith. Since the community of the nations of the earth, in a narrower or broader way, has advanced so far that an injustice in one part of the world is felt in all parts. The idea of a cosmopolitical right is no fantastic and strained form of the conception of right, but necessary to complete the unwritten code, not only of the rights of states, but of peoples as well, so as to make it coextensive with the rights of men in general, through the establishment of which perpetual peace will come. It is useless to flatter oneself that perpetual peace can be brought nearer and nearer under any other conditions. End second section. First supplement of the guarantee of perpetual peace. This guarantee is furnished by nothing less than the great artist nature. Natura de la rerum. Though the course of nature is mechanical, yet it clearly manifests the purpose to develop the concord of men through their discord, even against their will. Therefore, this power, considered as working necessarily according to laws unknown to us, is called fate. But from the point of view of the purpose which it manifests, in the course of nature, as the profound wisdom of a higher cause directed towards securing the final destiny of the human race and predetermining the course of the world, it is called providence. This power we do not, of course, see directly at work in the artistic constructions of nature. Nor again do we merely infer from them that such a power exists. But, as is always the case 
in every relation of the form of things to their final causes, we can and must, from these artistic arrangements, think such a power as existing, in order to form a conception of their possibility after the analogy of the operations of man's art. The representation to oneself of their relation and agreement with the moral purpose which reason immediately prescribes to us is an idea which theoretically transcends experience. From the practical point of view, for example, from the point of view of the duty of using this mechanism of nature to secure perpetual peace, it is an idea which imposes itself upon us and is well grounded in reality. The use of the word nature, when, as here, we are dealing simply with theory and not with religion, is more in keeping with the limits of human reason, which, in respect of the relation of effects to their causes, must keep itself within the bounds of possible experience. It is also a more modest term than providence, for, in using the word providence, we assume to know the mystery of its unfathomable purposes, and rashly put on Icarian wings in order to approach nearer to its secret. Before we determine more exactly the way in which this guarantee of peace is accomplished, it will be necessary to examine the state arranged by nature for the persons who act upon her great stage, which makes peace at last necessary. Then we will try to determine the way in which she makes the guarantee. The arrangements provided by nature are these. First, she has made it possible for men to live in all parts of the earth. Second, she has, through war, driven them everywhere into even the most inhospitable regions in order to people them. Third, through this same means, she has compelled them to enter into relations more or less in accordance with right. In the cold wastes about the Arctic Sea, moss grows, which the reindeer paws out from under the snow, in order itself, in turn, to become food for the Ostiak, or the Samojan, or to be hitched to their sledges. The barren sand wastes have the camel, which seems to have been created for traveling through them, in order not to leave them unused. All these things incite wonder. Purpose becomes still more evident when we learn that, besides the fur-clad animals on the shores of the ice-locked sea, there are also seals, walruses, and whales, whose flesh furnishes food, and their fat, the means of heat and light, to the inhabitants of those regions. But most of all is wonder awakened by the foresight of nature shown in driftwood, which, without it being known whence it comes, she brings to these treeless regions. For without this material, the inhabitants could construct neither their boats, nor their arms, nor their huts. They likewise have enough to do in their war against the wild beasts to make them live at peace with one another. We must suppose also that it was nothing else but war which drove people into different regions. Of all the animals which man, at the time of the early peopling of the earth, had learned to tame and domesticate, the first to be used for war was the horse. For the elephant belongs to a later time, when luxury came in with established states. Likewise, the art of evolving certain kinds of grasses, called cereals, the original nature of which is no longer recognizable by us, as well as the multiplication and improvement of fruits through transplanting and grafting, perhaps in Europe only the wild apple and pear, could only have arisen where states were already established and property in land recognized. All this could have come about only after men had left the lawless freedom of the hunter, the fisherman, and the shepherd, and entered upon an agricultural life, 
when salt and iron were discovered, which were, perhaps, the first widely sought articles of interchange between different peoples. Through this interchange men came into a peaceful relation to one another, and even those far removed from one another were brought into intelligent association and friendly relationship. While nature has taken care that men might be able to live everywhere on the earth, she has at the same time despotically willed that they must live everywhere, even against their inclination. She has not, however, imposed upon them any sense of obligation thereto by means of a moral law, but has chosen war as the means of compelling them to fulfill her purpose. We see peoples, indeed the unity of whose descent is recognized by the unity of their language, as the Samajades on the Arctic Ocean on the one hand, and on the other a people of kindred speech a thousand miles away in the Altaian Mountains. Between these, another people, Mongolian in origin, warlike and equipped with horses, has thrust itself, and thus driven one section of the tribe far away from the other into the inhospitable polar regions, whither certainly they would not have gone of their own accord. In like manner the Finns in the northernmost region of Europe, where they are known as Laps, have been widely separated from the Hungarians who are related to them in speech by Gothic and Sarmatian peoples, who have forced themselves between them. The Eskimos in the north, who, entirely distinct in race from the other American peoples, are probably descendants of ancient European adventurers, and the Pesheret at Tierra del Fuego, in the far south of America. What can have driven them into these regions except war, which nature uses as a means to people the earth everywhere? But war itself needs no special motive for its explanation. It seems to be engrafted on human nature, and to be regarded indeed as something noble, to which man is incited by the instinct of honor, without any selfish motives. Thus warlike courage, not only among the American savages, but also among the European, in the times of knight errantry, was judged to be of great intrinsic value, not only in time of war, as is reasonable, but also as a ground of war. War has often been entered upon merely to demonstrate this courage, so that war in itself is regarded as having intrinsic worth. Even philosophers have indulged in praise of it as something ennobling to humanity, unmindful of the saying of a certain Greek, War is bad because it makes more bad people than it takes away. So much as to what nature does for the accomplishment of her purpose in reference to the human race as a species of animal. As to her purpose of bringing about perpetual peace, the essential question now is, what does nature do in promoting this aim in reference to the purpose which man's own reason imposes upon him as a duty? What does she do in furtherance of his moral purpose? How does she make it certain that what man ought to do, but does not do as a free agent, shall be accomplished without detriment to his freedom by compulsion of nature, and that too in all the three relations of public right, namely national right, international right, and cosmopolitan right. When I say of nature, she wills that this or that shall take place, this is not the same as to say she imposes upon us an obligation to do it, for only the free practical reason can do this. The meaning is that she does it herself, whether we will or not. Fata volentum ducunt, nolentum trahunt. Even if a people were not compelled through eternal discord to put itself under the restraint of public laws, war from without would compel it to do this because, according to the previously mentioned arrangement of nature, every people finds at its side another people crowding upon it. It must therefore form itself by internal arrangement into a state, in order, as an organized power, to be equipped against the neighboring state. 
Now, the Republican Constitution is the only one which is fully in accord with the rights of man. But it is the most difficult to found, and still more difficult to maintain. Indeed, it has been asserted by many that such a state could be formed only of angels, because men with their selfish inclinations are incapable of maintaining an organization of so lofty a form. So, nature comes to the aid of the rational and universal will, which, though honored in itself, is powerless in practice. She does this through exactly these selfish inclinations, so that it requires only a good state organization, which men certainly are capable of forming, to so array their forces of selfishness against one another, that the one will check the other in their disturbing influence, or even destroy them altogether. In this event, the result for reason is the same as if neither of the forces existed. In this way, the man, although not a morally good man, is nevertheless compelled to become a good citizen. The problem of the constitution of a state, however hard it may sound, would be capable of solution even by a race of devils, if only they had understanding. The problem runs thus. How can a multitude of rational beings, who together desire general laws for their preservation, but every one of whom is in secret inclined to accept himself from their authority, be so brought into an orderly organization that, although in their private sentiments they are opposed to one another, they may so restrain one another that in their public relations the result will be the same as if they had no such evil inclinations. Such a problem must be capable of solution. For it is not the moral improvement of men, but only the mechanism of nature which is in question. What we wish to know is how to use this mechanism in the case of men in a way to bring the strife of hostile inclinations among people into such relations that they themselves will compel one another to submit to restraining laws, and thus bring about a condition of peace in which laws will have full force. This may be seen in the case of actually existing states, though they are very imperfectly organized. In their external relations they approach what is prescribed by the idea of right, though their conduct is not determined by the essential principles of morality. From these principles a good state constitution is not to be expected. On the contrary, much rather from a good state organization is the proper moral development of a people to be expected. Consequently, the mechanism of nature working through the selfish inclinations, which in their external relations naturally work against one another, can be employed by reason as a means of realizing its own purpose, namely, the reign of law, and thus of promoting and securing peace from within and without, so far as this lies in the power of the state. In this way, nature wills irresistibly that right shall at last have the upper hand. Thus what men neglect to do at last works itself out, though in very unpleasant ways. Bend but the reed too strong, it breaks. Who wills too much, he nothing takes. Butevec. 2. The idea of international right presupposes a number of independent neighboring states. Although such a state of things is really a state of war, unless there is some federative union between them to prevent the outbreak of hostilities, yet, from the standpoint of reason, such a condition is better than their fusion into one through the influence of a power which subordinates the rest and passes into a universal monarchy. For laws lose in force in proportion as dominion increases in extent, and a soulless despotism, after it has rooted out the germs of good, at last lapses into anarchy. 
Every state, however, or at any rate its ruler, desires to put itself into a condition of lasting peace by bringing the whole world, if possible, under its sway. But nature wills it otherwise. She makes use of two means to prevent peoples from mixing and to keep them separate, namely, difference of language and difference of religion. This, indeed, affords opportunity for mutual hate and an excuse for war. But with the growth of civilization and the gradual approach of men to one another, it leads to greater unity in principles, and to that understanding which leads to peace. Such a peace is brought forth and securely established, not, like despotism, by the weakening and destruction of all the forces of freedom, but through that equilibrium which is the result of a most active rivalry between them. 3. Thus, as nature wisely separates peoples whom the will of each state, even with professed respect for their international rights, might unite to itself through cunning or violence, so, on the other hand, she brings together, through their mutual self-interest, peoples whom the idea of cosmopolitan right would never have secured against violence and war. The spirit of commerce, here meant, cannot tolerate war and sooner or later takes possession of every people, because of the forces under the control of the power of the state, the power of money is the most indispensable, states see themselves compelled, of course not by motives of morality, to further the maintenance of peace, and wherever in the world war threatens to break out, to prevent it by mediation, just as if they were in a permanent league with each other for this purpose. For great combinations for the purpose of war can, in the nature of the case, only very rarely be made, and still more rarely can they succeed. In this manner, nature guarantees perpetual peace through the mechanism of the human inclinations. Of course, she does not do this with a sufficient certainty to enable us to make a definite prophecy of its future establishment. But the certainty is practically sufficient, and makes it a duty to work for the attainment of the end as not at all chimerical. End First Supplement Second Supplement Secret Article for Securing Perpetual Peace A secret article in transactions connected with public law is, from the objective point of view, or that of its content, a contradiction. Subjectively, however, judged from the point of view of the quality of the person who dictates it, there may very properly be matter for secrecy. Such a person may find it of very doubtful propriety to have it publicly proclaimed that he is the author of the proposal. The only article possible of this kind is contained in the following proposition. The maxims of philosophers concerning the conditions of the possibility of public peace shall be taken into account by the states which are armed for war. It seems, however, for the legislative authority of a state, to which, of course, must be attributed the greatest wisdom, to be belittling to seek among its subjects, the philosophers, instruction as to the principles of its conduct toward other states, though it may be very advisable to do so. Thus the state will consult them silently, making a secret of it. That is to say, it will allow them to speak freely and openly about the general maxims according to which war should be conducted and peace brought about, which, of course, they will do of their own accord, if not forbidden. The cooperation of the states in this matter will, however, need no special agreement among them to bring it about, for it is made certain by the felt obligations of the universal moral law set up by human reason. 
By all this is not meant that the state shall prefer the principles of the philosopher to the dictates of the jurist, who is the representative of the power of the state, but only that the philosopher must be heard. The jurist, who has taken as his symbol the scales of right, and at the same time the sword of justice, commonly makes use of the latter, not simply to ward off from the former all extraneous influences, but in case one side of the balance does not sink, to throw his sword into it. Ve victis. The jurist, who is not in the moral sense a philosopher, has the greatest temptation to do this, because his only business is to apply existing laws, not to inquire whether these need improvement. And this really lower order of his calling he reckons as belonging to the higher, because it is accompanied with power, as is the case also with the other two callings, theology and medicine. Among these allied powers, the philosophic holds a very lowly position. It is said of philosophy that she is the handmaid of theology, and such also she is said to be of law and medicine. But it is not quite clear whether she carries the torch before her gracious mistress or holds up her train behind. It is not to be expected, nor even desired, that kings should pursue philosophy, or that philosophers should become kings. Because the possession of power unavoidably destroys the free exercise of reason. But that kings or sovereign peoples who govern themselves according to laws of equality should not let the class of philosophers disappear or be silenced, but allow them to speak openly, is necessary to both for enlightenment in the performance of their functions. For this class of persons, from their very nature, are incapable of faction and club organization and cannot, therefore, be even suspected of propagandism. End Second Supplement Appendix Part 1 On the Disagreement Between Morality and Politics in Reference to Perpetual Peace Morality, conceived as a system of unconditionally authoritative principles according to which we ought to act, has in its objective significance a necessary relation to practice. It is therefore a manifest absurdity, after granting the authority of this concept of duty, to still claim that it cannot be carried out. For if this were so, the concept would of itself cease to come within the scope of morals. Ultra posse nemo obligator. Hence, between politics as a practical doctrine of right and morality as a theoretical one, there can be no conflict. Consequently, there can be no conflict between moral theory and practice. To make such a conflict possible, we should have to consider morality as a general doctrine of prudence, that is, a theory of the maxims in accordance with which one is to choose the means best fitted for the attainment of the ends dictated by self-interest. This would be to deny that there is such a thing as morality. Politics says, be wise as serpents. Morality adds, as a limiting condition, and guileless as doves. If both precepts cannot stand together in the same command, then there is indeed a conflict of politics with morality. But, if both injunctions are to be everywhere united, then the idea of any opposition between the two spheres is absurd, and the question, how such a conflict is to be reconciled, cannot even be raised. Although the saying, honesty is the best policy, contains a theory which unfortunately is very often contradicted in practice, yet the equally theoretical saying, honesty is better 
than policy, is infinitely above all reproach. Indeed, honesty is the indispensable condition of that which is politic. The god who guards the boundaries of morality is not subject to Jupiter, the boundary god of force, for the latter is still under the dominion of fate. That is to say, reason is not sufficiently enlightened to fully comprehend beforehand the predetermining causes which, if known, would enable us to prophesy with certainty the fortunate or unfortunate outcome of the doings of men, according to the mechanism of nature. However, we may hope that the result will be according to our wishes. But what we have to do in order to keep within the path of duty according to the dictates of wisdom, reason teaches us everywhere clearly enough beforehand, as she also does the real end to be kept in view. Now the practical man, to whom morality is only a theory, skeptically rejects our generous hopes. Though he grants the reality of duty and the power to perform it, he grounds his objection upon his pretended foreknowledge that such is the nature of man that he will never be willing to set before himself those purposes, the outcome of which will be perpetual peace. Of course, the determination of all individual men, acting in their distributive unity, to live under a legal constitution in accordance with the principles of liberty, is not sufficient for the attainment of this end. In addition, it is necessary that all together, expressing the collective unity of their united will, should determine to bring about this condition, in order that there may be a solution of the difficult task. The society of citizens must act as a whole. Above the diversity of the particular wills of all, a uniting cause must supervene in order to bring about a common decision which no one of them separately can make. Hence, in the carrying out of the idea in practice, it is urged, no other beginning of the social state under law can be counted on than that brought about by force, upon whose compulsion public right is afterwards founded. This, of course, leads us in advance to expect, in actual experience, wide divergences from the theoretical idea of right. For one can hardly assume such a moral sentiment on the part of the lawgiver that, after the union of the turbulent mass into a people, he will leave it to them to establish a legal constitution through their common will. This, then, amounts to saying that when once an individual has got power in his hands, he will not allow laws to be prescribed him by the people. A state which has so got control of itself as to be under no external laws will not allow itself to be subject to the judgment of other states as to the manner in which it will seek to maintain its right against them. And even a continent, if it feels itself superior to another, which is not at all in its way, will not leave unused the means of increasing its power, even through robbery or conquest. Thus, all theoretical plans for the establishment of national, international, or cosmopolitan right come to nothing but empty, unattainable ideals. On the contrary, it is urged, a praxis which is founded on the empirical principles of human nature and does not consider it beneath its dignity to draw wisdom for its maxims from the manner in which things go in the world can alone hope to find a sure ground on which to erect its system of political expediency. Of course, if there is no such thing as freedom, or moral law founded upon it, but everything which happens or can happen is only the result of the mechanism of nature, then politics, as the art of using this mechanism for the government of men, is the whole of practical wisdom and the notion of right is only an empty thought. If, however, 
It is found absolutely necessary to combine this notion with politics, nay more, to make it the limiting and controlling condition of politics, then the possibility of uniting the two must be granted. I can thus easily conceive of a moral politician, that is, one who so construes the principles of political expediency that they can coexist with morality. But I cannot conceive of a political moralist, that is, one who constructs for himself a system of morality in such a manner as to have it commend itself to his self-interest as a statesman. The moral politician will lay down the following as his fundamental principle. If defects are found in the constitution of the states or in the relations of states, which could not be prevented, it becomes a duty, especially for the leaders of the state, even at the cost of their self-interest, to endeavor to find out how it may be improved as soon as possible and brought into harmony with natural right, which is presented to us in the idea of the reason as a model. Since, now, the breaking up of the bond of union within a state or between states, before a better constitution is ready to be substituted for it, is entirely contrary to political expediency, and to morality too in this case, it would be evidently absurd to demand that those defects should be immediately removed, by violence if necessary. It may indeed be reasonably demanded of those in authority that they at least keep thoroughly in mind the maxim of the necessity of such a change, that constant approaches may be made to the end in view, namely, the best constitution in accordance with the laws of right. A state may even govern itself like a republic, although, according to its existing constitution, its supreme authority is despotic, until the people gradually become capable of being influenced by the proper idea of the authority of law, as if they actually possessed the physical power of the state. Thus they may become capable of self-legislation, the only legislation which is in accordance with fundamental right. If through the violence of a revolution brought on by a bad constitution, a more lawful constitution were secured in a wrong way, it would no longer be considered permissible to bring the people back to the old constitution, although during the revolution everyone who took part in it, either by violence or intrigue, may rightly have been subjected to the punishments due to a disturber of the peace. But so far as concerns the external relations of the state, it cannot be required of a state to give up its constitution, though it may be despotic, and perhaps, therefore, all the stronger in reference to external enemies, so long as it is in danger of being immediately swallowed up by other states. Consequently, when a proposal for a change is made, it must be held allowable to put off the execution of it to a more favorable opportunity. The despotic moralists, who fail in practice, are sure often to come into opposition to political prudence through hastily adopted or overestimated measures. In the case of such an opposition to nature, they must be gradually brought by experience into a better track. On the other hand, those politicians who make a pretense of morals, through their allowing of unjust principles of government, under the pretext that human nature is incapable of the good as prescribed in idea by the reason, may, so far as they have the power, make improvement impossible and perpetuate the violation of right. Instead of taking the course which men of professed political prudence boast of following, they follow what they call practical everyday methods. They flatter the present ruling power in order not to fail of their private advantage, while their real intent is thereby to sacrifice for their own ends the people and, as far as possible, the whole world. They act like lawyers, practicing lawyers, I mean, and not those who deal with legislation, when they turn their attention to politics. 
for since it is not the business of these to reason about the making of laws, but to apply the existing statutes of the land, every legal constitution which exists, and any subsequent one enacted by the authorities to take its place, always seems to them to be the best. Everything seems to them to be in its proper mechanical order. This skillfulness in adapting themselves to any saddle, as the saying is, may lead them to entertain the conceit that they can judge of the principles of a political constitution in general, a priori, and not empirically, according to the fundamental concepts of right. They may pride themselves on knowing men, which, of course, is to be expected, since they have to do with many persons. At the same time, they may not know man and what can be made of him, because for this knowledge a higher standpoint of anthropological observation is necessary. Now, if possessed of these notions, they take up the subject of political and international right, they cannot make the transition without carrying along with them the spirit of chicanery. Their customary procedure, with a mechanism of compulsory laws despotically laid down, they will attempt to follow in the new sphere where the concepts of reason permit only lawful compulsion according to the principles of freedom, through which alone a political constitution in harmony with right is possible. This practical politician, passing by the fundamental idea of right, believes that he can solve these problems empirically, by reference to experience only, declaring that the most permanent political constitutions have been set up this way, though these have most often been far from harmonizing with right. The maxims which he uses to justify his position, although he does not openly avow them, are thoroughly sophistical, and about as follows. First, fac et excusa. Seize the favorable opportunity to take arbitrary possession either of a right of the state over its own people, or over another neighboring people. The justification can be much more easily and gracefully made after the fact, and the act of violence made to seem like a good deed, especially in the former case, where the power and control is also really the law-making authority which must be obeyed without asking questions. The justification would not be so easy if, the convincing arguments had first to be thought out, and the counter-arguments heard and answered. The very boldness of the proceeding gives a certain appearance of inner conviction of the lawfulness of the act, and the god Good Luck is afterwards the best defender of the righteousness of the deed. 2. Si fecisti nega. When you have committed a wrong yourself, for example, such as to drive your people to despair and consequently to insurrection, deny that it is your fault. Declare, on the contrary, that it is due to the refractoriness of the subjects. Or, in the case of the seizure of a neighboring people, that it is the fault of the nature of man, who, if he does not anticipate his neighbor in the employment of violence, is sure to be anticipated by him and enslaved. 3. Divide et impera. That is, if there are certain privileged chiefs among your people who have chosen you simply to be their leader, primus inter pares, set them at outs with one another and with the people. Then stand by the latter, under the promise of giving them greater freedom, and everything will depend on your arbitrary will. In the case of foreign states, the arousing of misunderstanding between them is a tolerably sure way of subjecting them to yourself, one after another, under the pretense of aiding the weaker. To be sure, nobody is now ensnared by these political maxims, for they are all generally well understood. Nor is it felt that there is anything shameful about them, as if their unlawfulness were plain to everybody's eyes. 
The great powers never feel shame before the judgment of the common people, but only before one another. As far as concerns these fundamental principles, it is not publicity which can put them to shame, but only failure to succeed. For in respect of the morality of the maxims, they are all agreed. There always remains to them, therefore, political honor upon which they can safely count, that is, the honor of increasing their power, in whatever way this may be brought about. From all these wriggling efforts of an unmoral doctrine of prudence to establish a state of peace among men, instead of the natural state of war, so much at least is clear. Men can, as little in their private relations as in their public, escape from the notion of right, and they cannot trust themselves openly to base their politics simply upon the manipulations of prudence. They cannot, therefore, renounce obedience to the concept of public right, especially of international right. On the contrary, they allow all proper honor to it in the abstract, even though they devise numberless evasions and subterfuges in order to avoid it in practice, and to try to show that crafty and violent authority is the foundation and support of all right. In order to put an end to this sophistry, if not to the unrighteousness which it veneers, and so compel the false representatives of the mighty of the earth to confess that it is not right but force which they are upholding, the very tone of which they assume as if they themselves were in the seat of authority, it will be well to uncover the deception with which they mislead themselves and others, and to search out and make clear the ultimate principle from which the hope of perpetual peace springs. We shall thus find that all the difficulty in the way of its realization arises from the fact that the political moralist begins where the moral politician properly ends. He subordinates his principles to the end which he has in view, or puts the cart before the horse. His purpose of bringing politics into harmony with morals he thus thwarts. In order to make our practical philosophy consistent with itself, it is necessary first of all to decide the question whether, in the problems of the practical reason, we must begin with the material principle, that is, the end which we have in view as the object of arbitrary desire, or with the formal principle, or that based simply upon freedom in its outward relations, a principle which may be thus stated. Act so that you can will that your maxim become a universal law whatever the end in view may be. This latter principle must undoubtedly come first, because as a principle of right it is unconditionally binding, whereas the former is obligatory only under the supposition of the empirical conditions of a proposed end to be realized. If this end, for example, perpetual peace, were also a duty, its obligatoriness would have been derived from the formal principle furnishing the maxims of external conduct. Now, the former principle, that of the political moralist, when it deals with the problems of national, international, and cosmopolitical right, makes them all mere matters of policy, problema technicum. The latter, on the contrary, as the principle guiding the moral politician, to whom all such questions are moral problems, problema morale, is in its practical bearings as different as possible from this. It seeks to bring about perpetual peace not simply as a physical good, but also as a condition arising out of the recognition of duty. For the solution of the problem according to the methods of political expediency, much knowledge of nature is required in order that her mechanism may be rightly employed for the attainment of the desired end. Yet, this knowledge is very uncertain so far as the attainment of universal peace is concerned. Whichever of the three departments of public right you have in mind. Whether the people can be kept in real obedience and at the same time in prosperity, 
for a considerable length of time, better through severity or through flattering their vanity, through the domination of a single individual or through a joint administration of several leaders, through an official nobility or through a representative government of the people, is all very uncertain. In respect to these methods, history furnishes examples of opposite kinds under all forms of government, except that of a genuine republic, a form of government which only a moral politician thinks of. Still more uncertain is a statutory international right professedly devised by ministers. Such a right is in reality only a meaningless name, because it rests upon agreements in whose very making the privilege is reserved of violating them. On the contrary, the solution of the problem by the method of political morality is, so to speak, self-evident. It is clear to everybody. This method puts to shame all trickery, and leads straight to the accomplishment of the desired end, prudently remembering, however, not to be hasty and violent, but to go gradually and steadily on to the attainment of its purpose, as circumstances will permit. The command here, then, is, seek first the kingdom of the pure, practical reason and its righteousness, and your object, the blessing of perpetual peace, will come about of itself. For morality has this peculiarity, in itself, and also in respect of the principles of public right which it furnishes, and hence of a priori politics, that the less it makes its course dependent upon the proposed object, whether that object be a physical or a moral good, the more directly does it lead, as a general rule, to its attainment. This arises from the fact that it is the general will given a priori, whether of a single people or of different peoples in their relations to one another, which alone determines what is right among men. But this union of the will of all, if only we proceed consistently in carrying it out, even through the mechanism of nature, may at the same time be the cause of bringing about the purposed result, and of realizing the idea of right. Thus, for example, it is a fundamental dictate of moral politics that a people should unite to form a state only in accordance with the principles of freedom and equality as conceptions of right and this principle is based not upon prudence, but upon duty. However much political moralists may reason, on the contrary, that the natural propensities of a mass of men forming themselves into a society will render these principles powerless and prevent them from working out their proper effect, or seek to prove their assertion by examples of poorly formed constitutions, for example, of democracies which did not have a system of representation in ancient or modern times, yet they deserve no attention, especially since such a pernicious theory naturally tends to produce the very evil which it predicts. According to this theory, man, with the other living machines, is thrown into a class which only need to have the consciousness that they are not free beings to render them, in their own estimation, the most miserable of all the creatures on the earth. Fiat justitia periat mundus. This somewhat pompous proverbial saying is entirely true. It may be rendered in our own language, let justice be done, though all the rascals in the world thereby perish together. It is a bold principle of right which cuts right across all the crooked methods devised by craftiness or violence. But it must not be misunderstood and interpreted as a permission to push one's own right with the utmost severity. This would be a violation of ethical duty. It is to be understood as putting those in power under the obligation not to refuse anyone his rights, or even to diminish them, either out of dislike for him or sympathy towards others. For this purpose is required, above all else, an inner constitution of the state in accordance with the pure principles of right, and further, also a union of it with other neighboring or remote states 
for the legal adjustment of their disputes by a method analogous to that which would be employed by a universal state. This proposition means only that political maxims must not proceed from the welfare and happiness expected to arise to each state from following them, nor from the end which each state from choice makes its object as the highest empirical principle of political wisdom, but from the pure concept of right as a duty, from the principle of obligation given a priori by the pure reason whatever may be the physical consequences of such a course. The world will by no means perish because the number of bad men in it becomes smaller. That which is morally bad has in its very nature this characteristic, that, in the effort to carry out its purposes, especially in relation to others of like mind, it is antagonistic to itself and self-destructive. Thus it makes way for the morally good, even though it may be slowly. There is thus objectively in theory no antagonism at all between morality and politics. Subjectively, however, because of the self-seeking propensions of men, which, because not founded on rational maxims, must not be called really practical tendencies, such antagonism may and will always remain, because it serves as a whet to virtue. The true courage of virtue, if one proceeds according to the principle, tu ne seda males, sed contra odentior ito, in the present case, does not consist simply in meeting with a firm purpose the evils and sacrifices to be encountered, but in looking straight in the face and overcoming the far more dangerous, lying, and treacherous, yet sophistical, principle in us, which basely and cunningly puts forward the weakness of human nature as a justification for every sort of transgression of right. In fact, the political moralist may say, ruler and people, or people and people, do each other no wrong if they make war on each other by violence or cunning although they of course do wrong in refusing all regard for the concept of right, which alone is able to establish peace and make it permanent. For, it is urged, while the one violates his duty toward the other, who in turn responds by a like spirit of injustice, they serve each other right when they mutually ravage each other, provided they do it so as to leave enough of the race to keep up the sport to the latest times, in order that their remote successors may take warning from them. The method of providence in the course of the world is in this way vindicated, for the moral principle in man is never extinguished. The reason, which skillfully works out in practice the ideas of right, in the way above indicated, develops continually through advancing culture, and along with it also grows the sense of guilt for those violations of right. The creation of such a brood of depraved beings and their existence on the earth seems incapable of explanation on any theory of providence if we assume that the human race never will or can be improved. But this standpoint of judgment is too high for us. We cannot theoretically apply our notions of wisdom to the supreme unfathomable power. To such despairing conclusions are we unavoidably driven if we do not assume that the pure principles of right have objective reality, that is, are capable of being realized in practice, and likewise that the people in a state must act in accordance with them, and also states in their relations to one another, whatever objections to this course empirical politics may put forward. True politics cannot in accordance with this assumption, take a single step, without first having consulted morality. Although politics in itself is a difficult art, yet the union of politics with morality is no art at all. For whatever knot of strife there may be between them, which politics cannot untie, morality at once cuts into two. Right 
must be held sacred by men, whatever sacrifice the ruling power may have to make in its behalf. There is no such thing as a pragmatically conditioned right, no halfway ground to be thought of between right and utility. Politics must always bow the knee to right, though it may hope, in return, by slow stages to reach a height where it will shine forth in permanent glory. End Appendix Part 1 Appendix Part 2 Of the agreement between politics and morality according to the transcendental idea of public right. 1. Leaving out of view the matter of public right, that is, the different empirical relations of men in the state and of states towards one another, subjects with which the jurists generally deal, we have left the formal notion of publicity, the possibility of which is involved in every declaration of right. For without this publicity there could be no justice, which is conceivable only as it is publicly declarable. Hence there could be no right, as only by it is right administered. Every claim of right must have this capability of publicity. Since, therefore, it can easily be determined whether publicity is possible in any particular case, that is, whether it is consistent or not with the principles of the parties acting, it furnishes an equally usable a priori criterion by which the falsity or injustice of the pretended claim, pretensio juris, can be determined through, as it were, an experiment of the pure reason. Leaving out everything empirical contained in the concept of national or international right, as for example the baseness of human nature which renders compulsion necessary, we have the following principle which may be called the transcendental formula of public right. All actions having relations to the rights of other men, whose maxims do not allow publicity, are unjust. This principle is not to be considered simply as an ethical one, as belonging to the doctrine of virtue, but also as juridical, and directly touching the rights of men. For a maxim which I cannot allow to be expressed without thereby at the same time thwarting my own purpose, a purpose which must be kept thoroughly secret in order to succeed, and which I cannot openly avow without thereby arousing the opposition of all against the object which I have in view, such a maxim cannot awaken this necessary universal and therefore rational antagonism of all towards me for any other reason than because of the injustice with which it threatens everybody. This principle is furthermore simply negative, that is, it serves only as a means of determining what is not right towards others. It is, like an axiom, self-evident and also easy of application, as may be seen from the following examples in the field of public right. In reference to national right within the state, a question arises which many consider difficult to answer, but which the transcendental principle of publicity easily solves. Is rebellion a lawful means by which a people may throw off the oppressive power of a so-called tyrant? Non titulo sed exercio talis. The rights of the people are interfered with, and no wrong is done to him, the tyrant, by dethronement. Of this there is no doubt. Nevertheless, it is in the highest degree unjust in the people to seek their rights in this way, and they cannot therefore complain of injustice if they are defeated in the struggle, and afterwards, in consequence of their rebellion, have to undergo the severest punishment. In this case, much can be said, both pro and con, if the deduction be made dogmatically from the fundamental principles of right. But the a priori principle of the publicity of public right spares us all this circumlocution. According to this principle, the people would ask themselves, before entering into the social compact, whether they would be willing to have the doctrine of the right of an occasional rebellion publicly proclaimed as one of the maxims of their political procedure. 
it is easy to see that if, in the creation of a political constitution, the condition were made that in certain cases force might be employed against the supreme authority, it would be necessary for the people to assume to themselves a lawful power over that authority. In this event, however, that authority would not be supreme, or if both powers were made conditions of the setting up of the state, no constitution would be possible, and the purpose of the people to have one would be thwarted. The unlawfulness of rebellion is hence clear from the fact that a public declaration of adhesion to the doctrine of the right of insurrection would make the accomplishment of its purpose impossible. The principle would have to be kept entirely secret. Secrecy, however, would not be necessary on the part of the supreme state authority. He may frankly make it known that he will punish the ringleaders in every rebellion with death, even though they may believe that he has, on his part, first violated the fundamental law of the land. For if he is conscious that the supreme power which he possesses is irresistible, and this must be assumed in every civil constitution, because he who does not possess power enough to protect every individual in the state against every other has no right to command him, he need have no anxiety that he will thwart his own purpose by making known the maxims which he proposes to follow. It is entirely consistent with his position here taken to hold that, if the people succeed in their rebellion, the head of the state will fall back into the position of a subject and not undertake a counter-rebellion for the purpose of securing it again his former position, and also that he ought not to have to fear that he will be brought to account for his former management of the state. 2. Touching the subject of international right, we cannot conceive of such a right except under the presupposition of a state of society where right is embodied in law, that is, where those external conditions exist under which the rights of men are really secured to them. Because the very notion of a public right as such means the publication of a common will which secures to each individual what is his own. This juridic state, status juridicus, must arise from some sort of compact. This compact, however, must not be based on compulsory laws like that lying at the basis of a state it must rather be that of a permanent free association, like the above-mentioned federation of different states. For without a juridic state of society, actively binding together different persons, either physically or morally, and not leaving them in a state of nature, there can be nothing but a simple private right. At this point also arises a conflict of politics with morality considered as a doctrine of right. To this conflict, the criterion of the publicity of maxims may likewise be easily applied, but only on condition that the compact binds the states simply to maintain themselves in peace with each other and against other states, and not at all for the purposes of conquest. The following cases of antagonism between politics and morality also occur, for the solution of which our principle also provides. A. If one of these states has promised another something, for example, the furnishing of aid, the cession of lands, subsidies, and the like, the question arises whether, in a case on which the welfare of the state depends, it may consider itself free from the obligation to keep its word on the ground that it regards itself a double person, first, as a sovereign answerable to nobody in the state, and second, as the chief public official who must give account to the state. The conclusion being that, under the second title, it may consider itself absolved from the obligation taken upon itself under the first. It is evident that, if a state or its head should make known that this was its maxim, every other state would naturally either avoid it or unite with others to resist its pretensions. Thus, it is clear that politics, with all its craftiness, would frustrate its own ends by the adoption of such a principle of publicity. The maxims implied in the above question must therefore be wrong. b. 
If a neighboring power grows to tremendous proportions, potentia tremenda, and thus awakens dread, may we assume that such a power will be oppressive simply because it can, and is the right thus given to the less powerful states to make a united attack upon it, even though they have received no injury from it. A state which should declare this to be its principle of action would thereby bring on itself the dreaded evil all the more speedily and certainly. For the greater power would anticipate the smaller ones, and as for the matter of a union between them, that would be a slender reed of support against one who knows how to employ the principle divide et impera. This maxim of political prudence, again, if openly published, would necessarily prevent the accomplishment of its own purpose. It is, therefore, wrong. C. If a smaller state, by its geographical position, divides the territory of a larger one, which, for its own safety, requires this territory to be united, is not the greater state justified in conquering and uniting with itself the smaller one? It is clear that the greater state could not openly adopt such a principle in advance, for either the smaller states would hasten to unite beforehand for self-protection, or other powers would seek to take the prize. Consequently, the principle would, through publicity, render itself useless. It is thus proved to be unjust, and may be so in a high degree, for the smallness of the object does not prevent the injustice connected with it from being very great. 3. The question of cosmopolitical right I shall pass by without discussion because on account of the analogy which it bears to international right, its maxims are easily determined and estimated. Here, then, in the principle of the incompatibility of any particular maxims of international right with publicity, we have a good criterion for determining whether political methods agree with the principles of morality. But we need now to learn also what are the conditions under which the maxims of politics harmonize with the right of peoples. For the converse conclusion cannot be drawn, that whatever maxims permit of publicity are therefore necessarily right, for he who has the decisive power in his hands does not need to keep his maxims secret. The general condition of the possibility of an international right is the existence of a juridic state of society. Without this, there is no public right, but all right that can be conceived of as existing apart from this, in the state of nature, is simply private right. We have seen above that a federative state of the nations, which has in view simply the removal of war, is the only juridic state between them consistent with their freedom. So the agreement of international politics with morality is possible only through a federative union, a union which is therefore necessarily required by the principles of right. Hence, the proper work of political wisdom is the creation of such a union in its widest possible scope. For without such an aim, all its wise ways are nothing but foolishness and concealed injustice. There is a bastard politics addicted to this foolishness, whose casuistry puts to defiance the cleverest school of the Jesuits. Its first principle is mental reservation. In the making of public treaties, use such expressions as may afterwards, on occasion, be interpreted to one's own advantage, as, for example, by claiming that the status quo may mean either de facto or de jure. The second principle is probabilism. Assume wisely that others have evil intentions, or that the probability of your possible superiority gives a right to overthrow other peaceful states. Its final principle is that of the philosophic sin, peccatum philosophicum. Consider it a mere trifle easily forgiven, 
because it is to the advantage of the world when a large state increases its power by swallowing up a small one. The pretext for these sophistries is furnished by the duplicity of politics in relation to morals when it employs one or the other branch thereof for its own ends. Both philanthropy and respect for the rights of men are duties, but the former is only conditional, the latter an imperious, unconditional duty, and one must be perfectly sure that he has not transgressed it before he can give himself up to the sweet feeling of beneficence. Politics finds it easy to agree with morality in its ethical sense, where it teaches men to show respect to their superiors. But with morality as the science of right, before which it must bow the knee, politics finds it advisable not to make any compact at all. It rather denies to right all reality, and interprets all duties as mere matters of benevolence. This craftiness of a shady politics could nevertheless be easily thwarted by philosophy through the publicity of these wrong maxims, if politics would only venture to allow the philosopher to give due publicity to his principles. With this in view, I wish to propose another transcendental and affirmative principle of public right, the formula for which runs thus. All maxims which require publicity in order not to fail of their purpose are in harmony with right and politics combined. For if they can attain their purpose only through publicity, they must be in accord with the general aim of the public, which is happiness. To be in accord with this purpose and to make the people contented with their condition is the special problem of politics. But if this object is to be attained only through publicity, that is, through the removal of all suspicion of the maxims according to which it is sought, then these maxims must also be in harmony with the right of the public. For only in this right is the union of the purposes of all possible. The further development and exposition of this principle I must defer for another occasion. But that it is a transcendental formula may be seen from the fact that it is free from all empirical conditions, that is, from the matter of the law, and has reference only to the form of universal law. If, therefore, it is a duty to try to bring about a general state of public right, if at the same time there is a well-grounded hope of realizing such a state, though only gradually and approximately, then perpetual peace, which is to follow in due time the hitherto falsely named treaties of peace, which have really been nothing more than armistices, is not a meaningless idea. It is a practical task whose solution will be gradually worked out. The goal will be gradually approached, and let us hope, because of the general progress of human society, that the day of its coming is drawing near. End Appendix Part 2 and Perpetual Peace, a Philosophic Essay by Immanuel Kant, Benjamin Trueblood Translation.